Dear students, uh, my name is Mirahmed Vazilorkinovna and I am responsible for the lesson for the fourth course uh, and the ninth lesson. The theme is how to write a notation. Today we're going to be talking about annotating a text, which as you see here is a smart way to read. First, let's start talking about what we do as readers, because as readers, honestly, we're really complex and we do a lot of things. We do things like follow the plot and we visualize and we form opinions, we make connections, we wonder, we become emotionally invested. Now, let's be clear, not all of us are doing this at the same time. And if we are, we're not always aware of it. But regardless of where you are in your own reading development, doing these things make you a successful reader and should be consistently practiced and developed. And our goal in this class is to do just that through the use of annotations. Let's first define what annotations are. You've seen them commonly in texts that you read. As you're annotating, you're writing on the text. It's essentially what it is. You're interacting with the text you have in front of you. And as you see here, it results in a lot of your own words and thoughts being expressed on the text. The definition that we're going to use for our purposes is that annotations are the act of writing comments on a text as a way to do three things. One, further the reader's unique understanding. Two, draw conclusions. And or three, identify individual areas of confusion. I want to draw attention to two of these words, unique and individual. Because it's important to understand that while annotations are the practice of good readers, they are not produced in the same way by all readers, and that's okay. Specifically, for our purposes, we're going to be talking about seven types of annotations, and these are annotations that can be used across content area. So regardless of the class, these are the reading strategies you'll use while annotating. They include predicting. They include questioning, determining importance, tracking key vocabulary, summarizing, monitoring your comprehension, and making inferences. I'll talk about what those symbols are next to the reading strategy in a little bit. By the end of the semester, you'll be well versed in all of these reading strategies and will be able to independently apply their use successfully. For the purposes of this screencast, I'll introduce each strategy briefly through the use of our first assigned text in world literature, The Taming of the Shrew. Notice how I said I'm going to introduce them briefly because each one of these is very meaty on its own. We'll talk about the complexities behind each reading strategy and how that will influence your annotations later in class. Let's get started first with predicting. As I introduce each strategy, I'm going to show you this chart. The first column here focuses on student-friendly definition. So predicting means that you're anticipating what's coming up in the text. This symbol here that you saw on the previous slide indicates how you'll use this strategy in your annotations. And finally, this last column provides you with sentence stems that will allow you to communicate your thoughts when using this strategy in your annotations. Let's get to the example. I am going to be looking at the cover of Taming of the Shrew. And in this cover, it has the title and it has an image much like most covers for most books. One thing that good readers do is looking at the covers, right, to predict what's going to happen in the story. So that's exactly what I'm doing here. The P you see um, that I wrote above the annotation indicates that I'm going to make a prediction. The prediction that I made is based on the title and the image. I'm predicting that the woman, because I'm predicting that these are the same woman, got smaller because she got put in her place. So I'm using the title, taming I know means to control. Shrew I know refers to a certain type of female, uh, and it's not necessarily a good term. Um, so based on that title and based on the image here, this is the prediction that I came up with. Right. So it shows that I'm anticipating what's going to happen in the text based on what I've learned or what I already know about the topic. Before I continue, I want to note again that my annotations are unique to my understanding and analysis. Yours may be different because we approach text in different ways, and that's okay. Let's go on to the second uh, reading strategy. Now we're going to be talking about making inferences. 
Making inferences means to make decisions about what the evidence means. You mark this with an I, and here are a couple of sentence stems to help you when you're annotating um, with the purpose of making an inference. Here, I'm going to be using the first page of The Taming of the Shrew. And as I'm reading, so it's a Shakespearean language, and um, there's a lot that I have to sort through. But as I read, I made an inference right off the bat, right off the first page. And I'm inferencing that there's a problem between Sly, this character Sly, and the hostess, because they're insulting each other, right? Calling each other rogue, Sly saying he's not a rogue, he actually comes from Richard the Conqueror, talking about how uh, Sly apparently broke some glasses, and the hostess wants Sly to pay for them, but Sly is not having any of that, right? So it seems like Sly has been drinking and is acting aggressively. To make this inference, I had to do three things. One, I had to look at what the text said. You see that in my underline. Notice how there are various points on this page underlined. Usually to draw an inference, you need to look at various parts of the text. I also had to identify places that I connect to my background knowledge, whether that background knowledge is academic or personal. One example is the use of an exclamation mark. I know that when using an exclamation mark, uh, there's going to be some really strong emotions, right? That's some background knowledge that I have. I also know that a hostess works at a restaurant, so that automatically gives me some idea of what the setting is. And then I also have to think about what the text implies. So the hostess never actually says that Sly's been drinking. That's an, influ uh, an inference that I drew. But she does call him out for not paying for the glasses that he burst, which to me leads me to think that maybe he's been drinking. So all of these things led me to draw the conclusion, which you see in my inference annotation. That now brings us to questions. When I'm questioning, I'm doing a variety of things. Questions can have different purposes. I can either be clarifying my understanding, I can be wondering about what I read, or I can be asking a why based on what I've read. A question annotation is indicated through the use of a question mark, and I can... Uh, indicate this annotation through any of these sentence stems. The example that I came up with is when the Lord, another character, comes into, uh, into the same scene where Sly has been. And this is his reaction when he first sees him. He calls him a swine, so he's calling Sly a pig. And Sly has been, he's asleep. And the Lord is starting to think about what trick he wants to play on Sly, on this drunken man that he's found passed out. So my question is, Sly has already proven to be very aggressive, right? We just saw that in the previous scene, or in the previous page. What if he attacks the Lord? How will the Lord deal with that? So this is an example of a wondering question. And what you notice, or what you should know, is that the Lord just met Sly. But we as readers have already got an insight into his character. We know he's been drinking that he's gotten fairly aggressive, and that's something the Lord doesn't. My question shows I'm wondering about the future interactions between the Lord and Sly. That brings us to determining importance. When determining importance, I'm identifying significant details in the text, right? So I'm looking for very specific things that I may use as evidence in a discussion or when writing about the text. I indicate a determining importance annotation through the use of the acronym VIP which in this case will stand for very important point. And again, here are your sentence stems that you can use when writing about this annotation. Here's my example. So I'm going to look again at a specific part in the play where the Lord is talking, and he's talking to his servants. And um, he's talking specifically to one servant named Bartholomew. And he's asking him to dress like a lady, to go into the uh, to Sly's chambers or uh, Sly is um, staying, that everyone should call him Madam, so the servant Bartholomew is becoming a female, or dressing like a female, and to bear himself with honorable action, such as he has observed a noble ladies unto their lord. So he's essentially saying, act like Sly's wife. So here, these lines are leading me to draw a conclusion that the lord is really getting into his prank against Sly, and 
he's adding new elements to the prank as the scene evolves. So notice how when I'm identifying a, uh, an important part, my understanding of the plot deepens. And it deepens because I'm trying to focus on specific details. Now, the next reading strategy used in annotations, tracking key vocabulary, is a little bit more complex. Because when you track key vocabulary, you're marking important words for understanding in the text, but you're also identifying where class vocabulary words are used. And this can look a little different, so I'm going to give you an example of each. You mark key vocabulary through the use of a circle, and then you make a note of what that key vocabulary is. You don't just want to identify the key vocabulary, you always need to have some thinking behind it. The first example is one where the vocabulary that I'm identifying comes up in the text. So here the Lord is talking to um, some people that have just come into his house, and he's specifically addressing one of these people titled or called a player. And when talking about or talking to the player, he uses the word wooed, and that's not a word that I'm familiar with. And I wanted to determine what that word meant because it seemed important to me. To do so, I had to do three things. First, I had to understand the context in which the word was used. Who was talking to whom and about what? Which I showed you I do understand. The second is I had to explore the context clues. And you see that I underlined some words. Played, part, naturally performed. These words lead me to understand that the Lord's addressing an actor. So the player is actually just an actor. And they're talking about a play in which the actor uh, took on the role of a farmer's eldest son. Because of this, I started thinking, well, what are most plays about? And it leads me to think about love, which in turn leads me to the definition I came up with for my unknown word, which is to win over or to make fall in love with. The third step is to replace the unknown word with the known word or phrase. So it makes sense to say, "'Twas where you won over the gentlewoman so well, or where you made fall in love the gentlewoman so well. Both of those phrases make sense, and this is essentially me checking my work and making sure that I've learned a new word. This is a great way to build your own vocabulary. The second way is when the vocab word is from the class and doesn't directly pop up in the text. So here again, the Lord is speaking. Um, and what he's saying is leading me to form an opinion of him. In literature class, you're going to be talking about literary terms. One of the literary terms we'll be addressing is characterization. So while characterization does not actually appear in this section that I've circled, what the Lord is saying leads me to characterize him. And so the purpose of the word came up, which leads to my annotation, right? So in literature class, our key vocabulary will focus on identifying the key literary terms we'll explore. But keep in mind that this is going to be different for other classes. Next, we have summarizing where you restate the meaning of a text in your own words. And usually this is done when you finish a section of your reading. It's indicated through the use of an equal sign, and here are your sentence steps. At the end of um, scene, uh, the induction scene one, I wrote a summary, because this is a really good place to write one. And I came up with the Lord found a drunkard, Sly, and is going to play a trick on him. Super short and brief, but it gets to the point. I want to make sure that I do point out, however, that while the end of a section is a great place to summarize, it's not the only section, and you should feel free to summarize whenever you feel it's necessary. Finally, we have monitoring comprehension. This is where you can identify the part of a text where you stopped understanding, and then you can figure out how, you, how to get unstuck. You annotate through the use of a stop sign, and there again are your sentence stems. My final example comes again with the Lord, and the Lord talking about the play. And so I ask the question about the Lord's opinion of his servants, and how he's worried that they're going to get carried away. I'm wondering, I'm confused about what the, why the Lord would think this. So it's really important to understand that it's okay to get confused when reading. In fact, most readers, if not all, experience this at one point or another. And the first step towards clearing up your confusion is to keep track of what's confusing you. Because questions you ask to monitor your comprehension are great questions to ask the next day when you debrief the homework reading.